Welcome to our online series of formation conferences year 2 for the year 2021, entitled Sainthood and Spiritual Warfare During These Troubled Times. This program is hosted by the Archdiocese of Manila Office of Exorcism in collaboration with the Philippine Association of Catholic Exorcists. This video presentation is talk number 4, part 1, on the four openings to the diabolical, to be given by Father Jose Francisco C. Kia, Chief Exorcist of the Archdiocese of Manila. For more information and update of conference schedules for 2021, please visit www.facebook.com slash exorcism philippines. We also invite you to watch and share the links to our past episodes of conference talks found in our YouTube channel. For further information on the Ministry of Spiritual Liberation and Exorcism of the Archdiocese of Manila, for frequently asked questions, on how to contact us, and for available prayers to help you, please visit www.amoe.ph. Welcome to talk number 4, part 1, on the four openings to the diabolical, by Father Jose Francisco C. Kia, Chief Exorcist of the Archdiocese of Manila. Let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Mary Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So good day, I'm Father Jose Francisco Siquilla of the Archdiocese of Manila, Office of Exorcism. And our topic today will be the four openings to the diabolical, especially the what we call extraordinary diabolical attacks of the devil against us. Now, extraordinary demonic attacks can fall under four types. Of course, the worst would be possession, then oppression, obsession, and with regards to objects and animals and plants, infestation. Now, how does a devil attack us? Ordinarily, through temptation. But when we open certain openings in our lives, we call them the four openings. At least these are the openings in the ministry we have discovered throughout the years in the ministry. Now, the extraordinary forms of diabolical attack would be first, obsession. The attack is within the person. Oppression, the attack is from without. And possession, there is a full takeover of the body of the person. Now, man has certain faculties. We have what we call the material faculties. And these faculties, the devil can have direct access to and can directly harass the person th through these faculties because he is a pure spirit. For example, the emotions he can cause mood swings. The imagination, he can put images, and he can also see what you're imagining. And therefore, it is very important to purify our imagination because the devil can see what we usually imagine. And he can use that imagination, he can use those images against us. And the memory, the devil can trigger memories especially those which are traumatic and can cause hatred and anger in the person. Also depression and sadness. And therefore, we should also have a purification of the memory. 
now with regard to the spiritual faculties, the devil has no power over the sp spiritual faculties because they are beyond his power. Only God has direct access to them. The devil who is a pure spirit has no power over the spiritual faculties of man, only the material. He has therefore no power over the will. He can simply tempt us. And when a person is possessed, the person is unconscious. His will is non-operative. The devil cannot know what we are thinking. Only God knows what is in the heart. Although he can put thoughts in our intellect, he cannot read what is in our intellect. Now, each one of us has a certain capacity that if it is filled, we become possessed. And I would like to give, for example, uh, this schema. If, for example, a person has opened himself up to the diabolical spirits, and the diabolical spirits, more or less, we can say, gain a certain number in us, let's say 5%, there will still be no extraordinary demonic attack or manifestation. When the number reaches 40%, still none. When it reaches 60%, more or less, this is where obsession starts, what we call diabolical obsession. When the number of spirits reach a certain uh, percentage, 80%, then this is where oppression begins. And when the, the number of demons are 100%, then that is what we call possession. Now, some examples of obsession, diabolical obsession, are the following. As I mentioned, the attacks are internal. First, strong temptations and addictions that come out of nowhere. Secondly, frightening and blasphemous images and apparitions and superimpositions. That means I can look at a certain thing and I can see a diabolical image there, superimposed over the, uh, the natural object. Also, strong suicidal thoughts and impulses. For example, I go to a certain house or we can say infested home wherein a person had committed suicide. Usually the demons left behind there would be demons of suicide and death. And therefore, if I have, I'm more or less vulnerable, I can suddenly experience certain suicidal thoughts and impulses when I go and sleep maybe overnight in that home. Strong sexual thoughts and impulses that come out of nowhere. Blasphemous voices. Diabolical paranoia. Experiencing the presence of the devil around oneself. Sudden doubts regarding the faith. For example, I go to an occult practitioner, maybe a fortune teller, and then the next day, I have sudden doubts regarding my faith life, my faith in God, my trust in God. I suddenly experience an aversion towards what is sacred. Suddenly my, prayers, my prayer life becomes dry and I experience spiritual desolation. Intrusive negative thoughts, images, memories, and feelings which cause intense depression, anger, and fears. Now, oppression, diabolical oppression, as I mentioned a while ago, the attacks are external. For example, bruises and pains in the body without any external natural cause. And the feeling of movements within the body, like uh, ants under the skin, crawling under the skin, or snakes under the skin in the area of the stomach, Deterioration, non-diagnosis of sicknesses and heaviness. The person always feels drained. So this could be due to a curse. Night terrors. Incubus, succubus attacks. These are sexual attacks at night where the person experiences real dread and is sexually assaulted. The person is paralyzed, cannot move, 
And the person is experiences deep terror or a great terror. An easy sleep and insomnia. Divisions and deteriorations of relationships. This could also be due to curses. Drop and failure in business. Okay. It could be a competitor sent a curse to destroy the person's business. And uh, there's an effect. Unusual and grave sicknesses and sufferings. When it is already beyond the normal human experience. Series of bad luck and freak accidents, as we mentioned before, or in other talks, there's no such thing as bad luck or good luck. Everything is under divine providence. And therefore, when we say that a person has bad luck, he's actually under diabolical attack. Physical and sexual attacks during even waking hours. Now, possession is a full takeover of the body and its senses. The victim will have no recollection once the state of crisis is over. So as we mentioned, the person is unconscious. The will is inoperative. Okay, I would like to give the types of cases. Okay, as you notice, the biggest number of cases would be oppression around uh, more than 50%. Possession and infestation would come next. And obsession would be, in our statistics, in the Ministry of Exorcism in the Archdiocese of Manila, obsession, we have the, uh, a small number of cases that deal with obsession. Also, cases by gender. If you notice, six, 76% of our cases are female, while 24% are male. Now, some statistics. How many cases a day? Usually we have three cases a day, at least that was in the past. How many are purely psychological? In our experience, in my experience, around 15%. How many are diabolical or have a diabolical element? Around 85%. How long before the case is resolved? It can be from one session to at most one year. The average would be within three to six months. When it's a case not resolved, usually all cases are resolved as long as the person cooperates. The case is not resolved or the person does not find resolution, liberation, or healing, if the person does not cooperate, for example, changes his sinful lifestyle or make changes with regards to his virtues, his life of virtue and prayer. Now, as we mentioned, infestation focuses on a locality, an animal, or a plant. Infestation is, is when extraordinary demonic activity is centered on an animal, a thing, or a place. A haunted house would fall under the term infestation if the cause is proven to be demonic in origin. I remember exercising a dog once, and uh, while I was exercising the dog, it uh, jumped to the master, and uh, it possessed the master, the spirit possessed the owner of the dog. So this is an example of infestation that became possession. And we have many cases of infestation in Manila with regards to infested homes and uh, infested trees, infested objects, especially coming from occult practitioners. Even we have experienced toys of children being infested. And therefore, it is good to use holy water with regards to the toys of your children because evil spirits can attach to anything, any object of nature. Now, the case of science and parapsychology, I would want to talk a little about science and parapsychology. First and foremost, the devil is an expert in hiding behind science 
psychology and parapsychology. And uh, he is able to manifest his actions in a way that seemingly it is something physiological or psychological so that the person continues to suffer without uh, thinking that this may be something spiritual. So the person does not go to the, uh, ask assistance from the church or from an exorcist. And why does the devil hide behind usually science? Precisely so that as he attacks, the person does not protect himself properly. And later on, as the person gets harassed more and more, since uh, he doesn't know where it's coming from, usually he will end up getting angry at God and blaming God. Therefore, the exorcist must be able to discern with and beyond the scientific. Right? Now, I would like to go to the topic ec openings to extraordinary diabolical attacks. Okay? So what are the basic openings that we have discovered in the ministry that makes a person open to extraordinary diabolical attacks? And this is very important because the devil, when he attacks us, okay, uh, he will, before he attacks us or is capable of attacking us, he will create openings. And a number of these openings are he creates by deceiving people. People do not see that uh, there is something wrong with them. And therefore, be, through deceit, w one opens himself up to these diabolical spirits and gets harassed extraordinarily. So I would like now to go to these four openings that we usually find when we deal with cases at least in the Archdiocese of Manila. For the four openings, the four openings that give the devil more power over us. First, of course, sin and obstinacy in sin, having a sinful lifestyle. Secondly, psychic vulnerability through drugs, altered states of consciousness, developing your the powers of the mind, right? your so-called developing your so-called psychic abilities, in occult terms, opening your third eye, trauma, which is uh, another opening that causes woundedness, deep negativity in the emotions, causes unforgiveness and also dissociation. Okay? The person is. Uh, place into some form of trance, which makes the person vulnerable psychically to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. And of course, the occult, occult contamination. This is the fourth opening. Now, going to the first opening, of course, sin is the greatest opening, being obstinate in one's sin, vices, having a sinful lifestyle for a long, very long time. Every sin causes more disorder, which gives the demon, demons more power over us. Every sin attracts more and more spirits. Every additional demon creates a strengthening stronghold in the faculties, which causes addictions or what we call vices. So as a person sins again and again, more and more demons are attracted to that person. Like, okay, attracts like. And not only more demons are attracted, they attach to the person, they aggravate therefore the condition, they, they, they make this opening even greater, and more spirits latch on. And even more powerful spirits can latch on to this person. So much so that the person has a very difficult time already getting out of this sinful lifestyle. And I would like to quote Origen, a early church father, who tells us, every one of the seven capital sins with all its derivations is governed by a particular evil spirit that creeps into us every time it succeeds in enticing us to sin. The more an evil habit is hardened through the practice of evil, he tells us, the more that the demon corresponding to that evil possesses us. Going to the second opening, Okay. Creating, uh, that creates right? a doorway to the diabolical world of the fallen angels. 
the occult psychic ability or what we call the occult third eye. Now, in our case files, seven out of ten of our cases in the Archdiocese of Manila, seven out of them, seven out of ten of them have opened third eyes, occult third eyes, or they are basically psychic. Now, opening the occult third eye makes one psychically vulnerable to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. Now, how does science talk about this occult third eye? The area of science that deals with this, this uh, more or less occult dimension is what we call parapsychology. And according to parapsychology, The occult third eye is basically, they call it the psychic ability or psi, which is divided into two. ESP or extrasensory perception, by which I'm able to know things without using my five senses. Or psychokinesis or PK, that means I'm able to manipulate things around me in the environment without using any of my five senses. It is basically the power of the mind. Now, the psychic ability, in occult terms, we call it the occult third eye. And it is also known as the inner eye. It is associated with visions, clairvoyance, astral travel, and out-of-the-body experiences. It is true, according to them, through the third eye, that man will again possess the faculty of perception to the higher worlds, as well as have the ability to communicate with entities in these worlds. So you see immediately that we're dealing with a very dangerous opening because one becomes vulnerable to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. Now there is what we call the supernatural world where God is, where the angels, the good angels are, and the saints. There is the preternatural world, the world of pure spirits without grace. Those, this is the area or the dimension where the fallen angels are situated. And there is the natural world where we are, the plants, the animals, and human beings. Now, pagan man opens his occult third eye or develops his psychic abilities in order to gain access to a world beyond him. And this is what we call the preternatural world. He has no access to the supernatural world. It is only with the coming of Christ that man again has access to the supernatural world. So a Christian who is baptized, who has faith, and the Holy Spirit in his soul, is able to have access to the supernatural world and uh, through grace, as I mentioned. And therefore, it is very, very important that uh, we remember these different worlds because many times when people speak about a divine experience, an experience of God supposedly, you have to check. Is a person experiencing a being in the supernatural world or in the preternatural world? Now going to the occult third eye, I would like to uh, take from Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, one of the greatest visionaries of the church, beatified by Pope John Paul II. First, the question, is it good to develop one's psychic abilities or, as the occultists say, open your third eye? Now, this is her answer. When one becomes a clairvoyant or psychic, then one of man's faculties possessed before the fall, a faculty not entirely extinct, is in a mesh, certain measure resuscitated, and he lies helpless in the most mysterious state exposed to the attacks of the evil one. So you create an opening to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. Now taking from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, CCC 2116, it speaks about psychic abilities or the occult third eye. The phenomena of clairvoyance or psychic abilities contradict the honor, respect, and loving fear that we owe to God alone. Okay? God alone is enough. Grace is enough. We don't need to access powers outside the kingdom of God. Very, very dangerous. 
Now, some signs of being a psychic, an occult psychic, usually you have fleeting movements in one's peripheral vision. You tend to see shadows in your peripheral vision or maybe uh, white shadows or dark, dark shadows moving in, the, in your periphery. Also, a tendency to see ghosts, hearing whispers or other sounds to catch one's attention with no natural cause. You are a person who tends to smell something burning or foul, especially in places that are infested. Frequent goosebumps when in areas known to be haunted can seem to easily read people. Experiences frequently changes in body temperature from cold to hot or vice versa. Feeling one's head enlarging in areas that are known to be hunted. Frequent headaches and stomach aches, especially when one goes to an infested place. Heaviness in the shoulders. Pains in the spine and neck area. Tendency to have frequent mood swings with no cause. Your person who is easily hypnotized. You have a tendency to have a lot of distracting images and thoughts just popping into one's imagination and mind. You have a tendency to have vivid and lucid nightmares. They're so real. Tendency to have dreams that predict calamities, accidents, sicknesses, and death. Sometimes has out-of-the-body experiences when asleep can easily feel and be affected by the negative emotions of others and can easily be drained of energy for no apparent reason. So, so these are some indicators. <clears throat> and the more you have these indicators or the more of these indicators you find in yourself, the more psychic you are. Now, there are certain times in our life that when we are most psychic and therefore it is important to use the sacramentals during these, these times. When we're asleep, that's why uh, religious congregations, they use holy water in, the, in their cloisters before they sleep. It's not because they can you know, be tempted while you're asleep. It's because you can be diabolically harassed while you're asleep. Near death, when a person is dying, the body is weakening. The, the psychic abilities of the person or the psychic ability of the person becomes uh, more sensitive and therefore he may start to see uh, spiritual beings around him or her. So it's important to use holy water around the, the bed of, the, of a dying person to keep diabolical spirits from harassing the person so that he may be able to pray and, and continue to have hope in God. Also, childhood. Usually, uh, children are quite psychic because they are more right brain than left brain, but as they grow older, they lose this ability. Okay, so... Uh, it's important to use sacramentals on children, like blessing them regularly with holy water or exercise oil, putting exercise oil on their foreheads. Note, continue with, continued entering into trans states, altered states of consciousness, whether through Eastern forms of meditation, hypnosis, hallucinogenic drugs, new age mind expanding seminars, occult initiation makes one vulnerable, more and more psychic and vulnerable to the preternatural world. So be very careful because these are certain uh, activities that, that one can do that will make you more and more vulnerable or to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. You become more and more psychic. Your occult third eye opens because many people say that the occult third I is a gift. No, it is not a gift. The saints didn't have it. You don't need it to become holy. Okay. What we need is faith okay. and, and our relationship with the Lord. Okay. If, the, if the Lord desires to communicate with us, he uses inspirations or with, for example, the saints, he, through visions and locutions, but the, it is a supernatural direct intervention of God into our natural world. You don't need to be psychic. If it's God, he will be able to communicate with you. Also, one can mistake a change of consciousness, which is merely a psychological psychic phenomenon, as a religious experience. So some Catholics, uh, sadly, because they 
their prayer life is not that good, they turn to, to Eastern religions to, to supposedly experience the divine. And uh, what actually happens is that uh, they start to open little by little their occult third eye and they experience some form of a state of enlightenment which they think they are experiencing God. Well, in reality, they're simply, it's, a sim it's simply a psychic phenomena wherein they become more and more uh, sensitive to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. And therefore, the altered state of consciousness is not a religious phenomenon because it can be reached even by atheists or the most evil person. So a person who is... Uh, who even hates God can practice this so-called uh, New Age or Eastern forms of meditation and feel that he is getting in contact with the divine. He feels that uh, he's becoming one with the universe. So he feels that it, he thinks that it is an experience of God. While in actuality, it is simply a psychic experience. It is a psychological experience. It is an altered state of consciousness. And the uh, and, uh, big danger there is that, as I mentioned, once you're in that state, evil spirits can easily now communicate with you or appear to you. Or if you're a, a person trying to really live a good life and you were deceived, these spirits will start to harass you in ways that are extraordinary. Also, it is through prayer and virtue, not techniques, to bring about a trance state that we can, that we can only encounter God. And the dynamics in mystical prayer found in the saints are totally different from the dy dynamics found in altered states of consciousness. Okay. Now, some Catholics try merging Eastern forms of meditation with Catholic prayer. Okay, they try to join them. And this is very, very dangerous. Why? Well, a Catholic will only end up opening his so-called third eye and this will make him vulnerable to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. He would then, especially if he is striving to be holy, be open to either deceiving and lying spirits manifesting through false mystical experiences, or he would suddenly find himself suffering from intense temptations and extraordinary demonic attacks that were not present before. So it is very important that when we are praying and we study about prayer we want to learn how the prayed, the saints prayed it is very important okay, that we do not contaminate it with prayer styles from other religions okay? because the prayer styles of other religions as we said before their focus is on entering into some form of altered state of consciousness to experience supposedly the divine so they feel that they are one with the universe Okay. So it is very dangerous to, con to mix them because as we mentioned, it will simply open your third eye, your occult third eye, make you sensitive and psychic and you become open therefore to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. The third opening is trauma. One out of three of our cases in Manila has this opening. First, abuse attracts demonic spirits, especially abuse again and again, physical, sexual, emotional. And emotional wounds are created. Hatred forms in the heart. There is fear, depression, and unforgiveness. So abuse attracts demonic spirits, but the wounds are the ones that keep them there. They keep them attached to the person. And also during trauma, a person dissociates. What does this mean? That means a person escapes Mentally, his consciousness escapes from the situation, psychologically, so much so that uh, he enters into some form of trance state, which we mentioned a while ago, makes one vulnerable to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. It makes one more and more psychic. The more one enters into a trance state again and again, the more he goes into these states, the more he exp his psychic abilities or a cold third eye becomes open. Okay, dissociation is when the fight or flight response is overwhelmed. Escape is not by action in the real world, but through altering the state of consciousness. So I would like to quote from uh, the book Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman, a doctor. 
traumatic events serve as powerful activators of the capacity for trance. These altered states are similar to hypnotic trance states. These dissociative states are reached also through drugs and sought after by occultists. Okay. Okay, so it's very important that if a person experiences a lot of trauma, okay, it would be good to check whether the person's psychic abilities have been developed or his occult third eye has been opened. And it would be good to uh, seek assistance from, from the church if ever this is so. Okay, because uh, as we mentioned, this becomes an opening to the preternatural world of the fallen angels. And therefore, uh, of course, the person needs also healing, processing, psychological, psychiatric intervention. But there's also the spiritual dimension because the devil uh, really will make use of any kind of opening that man shows him to enter into the person's life. Remember, the devil is like a shark. If he smells blood, he will be attracted immediately and he will attack. Okay, the devil is just looking for any opening that we create in our lives in order to attack us. Now, the fourth and last opening is occultism. Occultism is a theory and practice invoking superhuman but not divine powers in order to obtain results that are beyond the capacity of mere nature. It is the power found in paganism and its derivations. Okay? Paganism or animism. This is the religion uh, found in uh, countries uh, that, have not, uh, that are not Christian or have not experienced uh, divine revelation uh, like Judaism. Okay. So we call those uh, the, religio the religions paganism or animism. Now, according to Holtis, these preternatural powers either come from within, that means we ourselves are gods, we have cert these certain powers according to them, or, or according to them, they come from more evolved beings in the spirit world. They can also come from nature. Okay? So that's why uh, we have, uh, for example, uh, witches who would worship nature and try to connect with nature to gain powers from nature. And we would see them trying to uh, communicate with the spirit world. Uh, we, through a, they would have usually a familiar, or in the new age, they would try to communicate with their spirit guide or an ascended master. Okay? They see them as more evolved beings by which they can gain certain knowledge and power. They don't need God. They simply have to be able to uh, have access to these spirits, these more evolved beings. Okay, magic and the occult. It is a, a worldview that believes in the existence of occult forces that affect human life and can be manipulated by rituals. So they believe that all around us there is this cosmic energy or occult energy that we can use and manipulate. As you mentioned a while ago, uh, this cosmic energy can be found in man, according to them, the occultists, or in nature. Now, this occult force it has already been denied by science. There is no such thing as a cosmic energy. And it's contrary to divine revelation. Therefore, any healing therapy or mind visualization technique that utilizes any kind of cosmic energy or spiritual energy is wrong and dangerous. This is simply channeling or mediumship. You allow yourself to be a medium or a channel, not on energy, but actually it is a spirit. It is a diabolical spirit. Occult forces are always through the intervention and action of the fallen angels. This is the teaching of the church. Occult forces are always through the intervention and action of the fallen angels. So to have some form of theological analysis with regards to this so-called cosmic energy, that the occultists use in order to gain some form of benefit. God did not create any occult force or occult forces in nature and in the cosmos which may even vie for the allegiance of man. Why would God create this kind of force when God can be replaced, so-called replaced, by impersonal occult forces? Also, would God create such a force that subjects man in hidden ways, especially negatively? Okay, why would God create this cosmic energy or cosmic force around us that if we don't follow certain rules, we will experience bad luck in our lives? Okay. 
would God create such a force which can be manipulated by man to get all worldly desires met and without effort? Why would God create such a force? That means we would rely on this force, this cosmic energy, instead of relying on God, instead of having a personal relationship with the Lord. Okay? God would never create such a cosmic energy or cos cosmic force that the cultists say is real and, we, and man can tap into. Okay? This is wrong. For example, many Catholics, or a number of Catholics in the Philippines, believe, believe in feng shui. Okay? Feng shui is common in the Philippines. Feng shui, according to the, the Vatican document, Jesus Christ, the bearer of the water of life, is a new age activity. Feng shui, according to this document, is an occult Chinese method of deciphering the hidden presence of positive and ne negative currents or energies in buildings and other places. So this is nonsense. Okay? As we mentioned a while ago, this is something that goes contrary to divine revelation. God did not create any occult energy or force in the universe. That's why I would like to quote St. Paul from his letter to the Colossians. See to it that no one deceives you through any empty seductive philosophy, a philosophy based on cosmic powers rather than on Christ. Also, the CCC 2117, all practices of magic or sorcery by which one attempts to tame occult powers are gravely contrary to the virtue of religion. The modern intrusion of paganism or occultism in the, new, in the world today is brought about through the New Age movement. Okay? So paganism and animism, these uh, religions are coming back, through the, especially through the New Age movement. Now, paganism or animism is a polytheistic, okay, it worships many gods, or pantheistic, it believes that God is one with nature and nature is one with God. We are all gods. Okay? And it is a nature-worshipping religion. Some of its foundational beliefs is pantheism, as we mentioned a while ago, the universe is God, hence nature has powers which can be used for good or bad. Man desires to control it. It also... Uh, focuses on psychic development. For them, it is a normal experience as man is the vital link in both the visible and invisible world. It is also polytheistic. Animists believe in a plurality of gods, both co-equal or in hierarchy. These gods are believed to have specific spheres of control. So in the Old Testament, paganism or animism is always seen as idolatry. In the New Testament, world, paganism and animism was demonic in nature. It was always seen as demonic in nature, which involved channeling demons or communicating directly with them, these guys as deities or gods or idols. I would like to quote St. Paul again. So what am I saying? That meat sacrifice to idols is anything or that an idol is anything. No, I mean that what they sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. I do not want you to become participants with demons. Okay. So when, you, when we offer like certain uh, uh, offerings to idols, Baals, for example, to spirits in the tree, okay, we're actually offering these objects to diabolical spirits. And therefore, they will have a stronger claim over us because we are submitting ourselves to them. I would like to quote Pope Benedict XVI, in the book, Faith and Politics, and uh, he states, the worship of idols was not merely a foolish and baseless affectation, but in its delivering over of man to, to the renunciation of truth had become the worship of demons. Behind the ineffectual gods to the highly effectual power of the demons, and behind the enslavement to customs stood enslavement to evil spirits. What does this mean? Custom, enslavement to custom. That means superstitious practices. We here in the Philippines have so many superstitious practices. And this enslaves us to the evil spirits. I would like to continue quoting Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. He says, being freed from custom for the sake of the truth meant being freed from the power of the demons that hid behind custom or superstition. Pagan gods were not mere illusions, but the fantastic masks 
behind which real powers and forces were hidden. In the Philippines, for example, we have this of blood offering, which uh, it's usually done before construction of a house, building, bridge, etc. Okay, so this is a, an idolatrous practice. It is a sin against the first commandment. We have to confess this sin. This is a very grave and serious sin in the eyes of God because you are offering blood to the fallen angels. Okay, uh, and therefore, we have to confess this sin. Especially when, it is, when blood is involved, it's not simply an offering of certain fruits or uh, food, but uh, a blood offering. Now, St. John Paul II speaks of those in the name of enculturation run into syncretism. Yes, it is good to enculturate the gospel, but there is a danger of what we call syncretism. And syncretism means we contaminate our faith with pagan beliefs, and practices, uh, the pagan religion contaminates the Catholic faith. So Pope John Paul II states, there is therefore a need for constant vigilance against all possible forms of syncretism because syncretism is harmful. Pope Benedict XVI also warns us that interreligious dialogue when badly understood leads to muddled thinking or to syncretism. Okay. For example, in an example of syncretism found in the homes of some Catholics is common to find good luck charms like pagan deities in the homes of certain Catholics okay. to, for good luck and protection against bad luck. So this is syncretism. What is therefore proper enculturation? According to Pope Benedict XVI, it is the correct integration of the authentic values, okay, the values of cultures into the Christian faith. It liberates from occultism and vanquishes evil spirits, for it is moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the early church, Greek and Roman philosophy had been inculturated successfully because they do not deal with pagan occult beliefs and practices. It is therefore important that before we inculturate a certain tradition, we first discover its origins if it was born out of pagan occult dealings with the preternatural world. I would like also to quote the Directory on Popular Piety and the Liturgy from the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments. What is said of the Christian liturgy is also true of popular piety. It may never incorporate rites permeated by magic, superstition, animism. The last point, so the the connection between exorcism and the sacrament of reconciliation. When we go to the sacrament of reconciliation, God destroys the stronghold of the devil over the soul. But the sacramental of exorcism destroys the stronghold of the devil over the body. So, exorcism assists and facilitates the sacrament of reconciliation. Now, when we do exorcisms, we can, uh, the exorcist uses both the old Roman ritual and the new Roman ritual. He, he can pick. But when we do diagnostic exorcisms to test whether the person is really possessed or not, we use the old one. Because the new one uh, cannot be used unless there is a moral certainty that the person is really possessed. If you notice, uh, if you know some exorcists, they always use exorcism rings. Okay, these are used for emergencies if you don't have a crucifix at hand uh, and uh, a case arrives in the home of the exorcist and therefore it would be good to have this. The exorcist usually has this exorcism ring. And also uh, it is used for violent cases where it would be hard to keep the crucifix on the head of the possessed person because the person will be very movable. Okay? And also uh, when there is minimal reaction the exorcism ring on the hand of the priest, okay, as he places his hand on the head of the demoniac, he, can, uh, exp he will be able to feel tremors, for example, uh, in the person as he reacts to certain prayers. And he, it will also give the exorcist a clue what prayers affect the demon the most. Or if the person or, or the demoniac is about to go into a real crisis state, 
okay, the, the exorcist will be able to sense the tremors or the convulsions as he becomes stronger and stronger uh, in the body of the person. Also, we use exorcism stoles. Usually, these are quite long because it has to be placed around the neck of a demoniac. And at the end, we have uh, we place uh, a uh, Saint Benedict's medal uh, image, which is blessed. And uh, of course, we use the sacramentals of the church. We attack all five faculties in the person if he is possessed by a demon. We use holy water and exercise oil for the sense of touch. For the sense of hearing, we use the exercise bell. For the sense of taste, we use exercise salt. For smell, we use exercise incense. And for sight, we use the crucifix. Now finally, there are four characters in an exorcism. God, the exorcist, the devil, and the victim. Many people think that exorcism is about the battle between the exorcist and the devil. But the real, the, the, the most important characters, of course, they are God and the victim. The exorcist is simply an instrument by which God destroys the stronghold of the devil in the victim. So the relationship between, the, between God and the victim is reestablished. And as, as the devil is expelled from the picture, the exorcist also decreases. He simply points to Jesus. Okay, and the victim begins that beautiful relationship, a renewed relationship with Jesus, with God, the angels, and the saints. So thank you very much. And uh, let's pray for one another. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, I fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, my Mother, to you I come, before you I stand, sinful and sorrowful, O Mother of the Word Incarnate, despise not my petitions but in your clemency, hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Special thanks go to Father Jose Francisco Siquia for the video of the conference. Father Nanette Sila Gospi, for video editing. And Miss Rowena Delos Reyes for the posters and graphics of the presentations. Background music is entitled, To a Lonely Place to Pray, performed by Father Arnel D.C. Aquino, S.J., from the album Lauds, Volume 4, of the same title. Stay tuned for Part 2 of Talk Number 4, on discernment of extraordinary phenomena by Father Jose Francisco Siquia tomorrow, March 2, 2021, at 8 p.m. For an update of our next season of conferences for 2021, please visit www.facebook.com slash exorcism Philippines. A YouTube link will be provided our viewers for all scheduled talks. We also invite you to watch and share the links to our past episodes of conference talks found in our YouTube channel. For further information on the Ministry of Spiritual Liberation and Exorcism of the Archdiocese of Manila, for frequently asked questions, on how to contact us, and for available prayers to help you, please visit www.amoe.ph. Thank you and may God bless you and keep you safe.